I first saw James McNeil Whistler's 1861 astonishing painting of his partner, lover, model, muse, housemate, helper, inspiration, sometimes combatant, Joanna Hiffernan, almost half a century ago. My parents had taken me to the National Gallery, and I remember looking up at her long, red, unkempt hair and luminous aqua green and almost liquid eyes as if you could melt right into them, and that unadorned white dress that felt like it just might be her nightgown as if she somehow invited me into a very private space. I was enthralled with her, and the stark, uncluttered simplicity of the painting was a welcome change from the clutter of the museum, for it felt cool and simple and inviting, a sort of sea of variations on white. And I liked her immensely, and all was good with the world, until I looked down instead of up. Mom, why is there blood and pieces of flesh all around the bearskin? Shh, shh, we're in an art museum. It turns out that the answer to why the blood in gobbets flings the door wide open upon Whistler, upon Joanna, upon their relationship, and to some fascinating truths of the early 1860s when the painting was ridiculed at early exhibitions. And ridiculed is the right word for the same now-cherished and esteemed portrait hanging in pride of place and considered one of the masterpieces and key works of the National Gallery was at first met with a full gamut of criticism running from rejection from exhibitions, derision, and ridicule to a kind of nervous, giggling fascination as if people were looking at a freak show. Whistler was deeply disappointed, but he understood perfectly the conventions he was actively flouting in the painting. He had tossed his visual grenade into the ranks of traditional art values, and he knew it. So, just what aesthetic bombs did Whistler toss at convention? First, he paints Joanna in an oversized portrait, adopting the formal characteristics of a grand manner portrait, a style of portraiture usually reserved for nobility or the very rich or occasionally the famous. Joanna had emigrated from Limerick during the famine. She was dirt poor and neither famous nor of rank. Her dress was casual, comfortable, perhaps even sleepwear, and you would never see it out in public. This rankled, unsettled, and probably titillated viewers. A grand manner portrait might be a mouthful, but it was a long-established style of painting, where someone wealthy or a member of royalty, rank, or fame would tower above the viewer in an oversized picture that would usually contain a lot of signs or objects hinting at that person's wealth and stature. Here are two by Jack Louis David. And then there is one which does not quite conform to the standards and caused a bit of scandal at the time. In fact, this portrait by David or School of David from 1798 probably had some influence on Whistler. I love her face, but unlike the other two, it just exudes a kind of casual informality, and that was scandalous. Now these three grand manor portraits are by John Singer Sargent from just a little after Whistler's great painting. I include the first because they didn't have to be stuffy or cluttered. She was a known member of society and her outfit is so cutting edge couture, it says everything. I love this painting. She carries her wealth and stature with style. Sargent's third painting created as much discord among early viewers as Whistler's portrait. This is Louisiana-born Madame Gautreaux. And somehow, her extraordinary self-possession, artistry, style, intelligence, erotic depths sent viewers into a tailspin. Perhaps there's even a bit of cinematic femme fatale 60 years before that flood. But whatever dangerous revelation and transgressions Madame Gautreaux and Sargent brought to fruition in the painting, it now feels quite the masterpiece, and she feels so utterly alive. But back to Whistler. With the frame, Joanna's portrait is seven feet tall, 
hung it two or three feet above the ground. Even the tallest of viewers stares up at her. I've superimposed my photograph to indicate scale. Even though I'm 6'3", she towers above me, now as she did when I was a kid. That towering above of a grand manor portrait is great in 1860 if you're looking up at a captain of industry or someone of wealth and rank or fame, but not necessarily a young Irish woman fresh off the boat. In truth, I think it's infinitely better. The very looking upward necessary to view a grand manor portrait physically performs a sort of submissive act of homage to someone of power, wealth, and prestige. Through that endlessly repeated act of looking upward, the very tradition of grand manor portraiture subtly reinforces class hierarchies and distinctions and drew lines between people. And there goes James McNeil Whistler and Joanna Heffernan blowing it all up. Actually, though what he has done, what they have done, by rendering her in a grand manner portrait is so much more subtle and lovely. He is insisting on Joanna's value in her inner wealth and stature. The simply human, intelligent, creative, caring, sensual, and compassionate in her, now rightly seen, puts her on par with any subject decked out with finery and titles and wealth. She's a bit of a goddess up there, but it's not like the title is glooped on her like a mask, but rather enacted by the beauty and sacredness of her human being utterly outside of class, and that made viewers squirm. What else made them squirm? A woman in white in 1860? Wilkie Collins's woman in white was everywhere. It was literally the talk of the town. Whistler denied having read it and denied his painting illustrates Collins's character, and I agree, what it does is way more exciting than that. Collins' Woman in White was a sensation novel. What that genre does is takes the gothic extremes of an earlier era, the bizarre transgressions formerly enacted on or beyond the Carpathians or in castles with hidden rooms, and brings those transgressive behaviors right into the drawing room or bedroom. It pulls back the veil and opens up the secret theater of home. And at the very moment Whistler is ordering up his zinc white oxides and titanium whites, look what readers have just been through. In Dickens' immensely popular weekly all the year round, the last ripping lines of A Tale of Two Cities, it is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. And in the very next column, the beginning of Woman in White, the woman in white, why are we to stop her, sir? What has she done? Done. She's escaped from my asylum. Don't forget a woman in white. And no one forgot she was everywhere. But even if not an illustration of the book, the painting is, in a sense, a sensation painting. It's a privileged glimpse into an explicitly private space. And that glimpse into the secret theater of home defines the new genre. Whatever else Joanna's inscrutable expression is, blink and it becomes a sense of shock and dismay and plunge into blankness at some unmasterable excess. And there is at core some ineffable passion play like a quiet tsunami between painter and subject transgressions. We've already exploded class, Eros is everywhere erupting, and there is blood dripping from the bearskin. Yes, 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 it is a sensational painting. And what about the bear? Well, first, it's a polar bear. And in the late 1850s and early 1860s, people were so obsessed with the Arctic, with tragic Arctic explorations and the Arctic sublime, you can't have a polar bear that doesn't call to mind that other frozen land of white on white. And symbolically, the North Pole is the ultimate other world, that white on white place of silence and frost and death and sublime beauty. Here is Frederick Church's painting from the same year as Whistler's, 1861, 
and in a very different way, it is also a study of white upon white. Curiously, Whistler is not the only artist to explore the iconography of women upon a polar bear. Fashion glamour movie photographer George Harrell would use the prop of a polar bear to bring out and amplify the aura of femme fatale. These were like the dangerous bad girls of noir, Veronica Lake and Anne Sheridan, and my favorite, the dangerous but irresistible Lisbeth Scott. The bloody bear? Of course it bleeds. Whistler and Joanna both knew they lived on the dangerous edge of things. Art is just that way. And they were both hellcats. And Whistler's mother, remember her, hated that Joanna came from a poor Irish family, so there was built-in family strife. They knew that love and art and crossing class lines in the 1860s and two strong creative souls that were both fire and flood would dive into a pity beyond all telling that is the heart of love, and that both of them were going to love and strive and bleed like hell. The blood, it's there. Whistlers and Heffernans and the wild spirit of the bear, it's their volition, their violation, and their bond. Symphony in white with hemorrhaging in hearts. That fits. Thank you for watching. If you like this, please check out and subscribe. It's brand new, but it's about the history and psychology of crime, about detective fiction, about literature, and about the visual arts. I love making videos about subjects I've thought about for decades. I'll explore the way classical mythology continually spills into the modern world. I've already released videos about Medusa, Danae, and Andromeda as part of the Mythology Now series, and Pandora and Persephone are coming soon. Then it's Judith and Holofernes and Salome in painting. And then I turn to angels. Then it's a review of the essential top 10 true crime books. And then something fun and fascinating about Dashiell Hammett, the pulp magazine Black Mask, and the birth of hard-boiled detective fiction and film noir. And then it's on to Edward Hopper and fabulous Picasso. So please subscribe. There's a lot on the way.